Dragon's Dogma 2 is genuinely one of the best action RPGs I have ever played. While its launch was led by a tremendous amount of hype and people's expectations were through the ceiling, the release was faced with a mixed reception from fans and newcomers alike. And to be fair, I believe to some extent that some of those arguments are totally right. At its core, Dragon's Dogma 2 is an epic adventure, a true gem with some rough corners. The real beauty of this piece of art, however, lies beneath its open world structure, something we've rarely witnessed in the past few years. A kind of design philosophy that is nothing like regular open world games and to be fair, only less than a handful of other titles had something unique in their structure that would set them apart from the competition. In the current state of gaming where most of the open world titles are usually bloated with tons of icons or question marks, Dragon's Dogma 2 drops out and over and sets a very high standard for open world games. A standard that encourages you to explore its world. There aren't any heaps of icons, vastly open but useless terrain or copy and pasted activities to artificially elongate the experience. The world, while it's big, is not overwhelming and you will find yourself captivated by its cleverness. But you may wonder, how Dragon's Dogma 2's open world is a masterclass in exploration? While we're all sitting here and by the looks of it, the daylight is yet to arrive, why not share that story around the fire over some food? Well then, allow me to begin our tale. To understand Dragon's Dogma 2's open world structure, we must first understand the meaning behind its core theme, willpower. And don't worry, I will not spoil the whole story or the end game for you. Willpower in simple terms means the mental strength and determination to achieve something. Now there's another term called will to power, which comes from the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche. Imagine Will as a driving force behind everything you do. It's not just about wanting things, but the active is striving to make them happen. Now, add power to that. Not necessarily power over others, but the power to shape your world and overcome challenges. So the will to power is basically a deep human desire to act, influence and create the life you want. It's the push to overcome obstacles and keep growing, learning and achieving. Patience, my pupil. Dragon's Dogma 2 fully embraces the concept of that idea. One can argue that the entire story is based around it and you can clearly sense its presence from the very first moment that you press the new game button till the credits screen rolls up. But the fascinating thing is that this concept is also deeply rooted in the gameplay as well. But how does willpower incorporate itself into the gameplay? As the Arisen, or the chosen hero, you begin your journey from the lowest point down in the south of the map in your weakest form. Thanks to the help of a griffin and through some divine intervention, you're brought to the upper point of the map. This is the point where the game will truly put you through different trials to test your willpower both as the Arisen and the gamer. Your main challenge is to gain enough strength to go back to the point where everything started or let's say everything was seemingly finished for your character and make a big difference now that you have enough power and a stronger motive to do things. In concept, that might sound pretty simple, but the execution is just perfect. There's a stark difference from the Arisen's initial starting points in the story, aka the bottom of the pit, which is a mining camp for pawns, to the place you truly start this journey. The difference is visible in the color palette of the game, which is darker and grittier in the mining camp and you can't find any sense of hope or freedom in it. It feels like the end of the world, where you can sense the looming shadow of the Mungling Tower above your head. But it's quite the opposite in the upper parts of the map, which is brighter, more colorful, vibrant and full of life. This contrast in the environments is a signal to the possibility of reviving the hope once lost, provided that you have the will to finish the task at hand. The first thing you immediately notice is how different the world of Dragon's Dogma 2 is structured compared to other open world games. The world, while it's open and allows you to go wherever you want whenever you desire, limits your movements in a clever way. Unlike Tears of the Kingdom or Assassin's Creed games where your character has the maneuverability to climb almost anything, most of the cliffs and mountains in this game are untraversable. The movement mechanic affects your exploration of the world. Just like in real life where you can't easily run up places and jump everywhere, in this game you cannot simply traverse the extremely steep curves as your character would slide and fall onto a more solid and even terrain. There's also a stamina system present in the game that limits your overall movement whether in combat or traversal. 
All of these combined together would change how you take your next step and how you overcome the environmental challenges. And while the ocean takes the majority of the map's size, you cannot swim in any bodies of water due to the existence of brine inside it. So as soon as you, your companions or the enemies enter the deep water, death is imminent. Therefore we can come to the conclusion that the world of Dragon's Dogma 2, while it's definitely huge, is still limited in some ways. But that's what you're seeing at the surface level. We'll get into that in a moment. The world design of Dragon's Dogma 2, whether we talk about Vermont or Batal, gradually expands. So it means that the paths are constrained at first and slowly open up to players the further they venture. This is designed in a way to prevent players from getting overwhelmed with the sheer size of the map or the amount of side content the game offers. To demonstrate this, the early hours of the gameplay consists of you following narrow routes, reaching your first encampment, learning about the situation, moving on to the next major establishment, which would be a village named Melv, and finally, you'd be able to unlock the gates to a wider world. From this point onward, you get to choose to follow the main road to reach Wernworth, the capital city of Vermont, or stray from the beaten path and follow your instinct. Let's get back to the point where we still haven't opened the gate to the wider world. The opening section of the map, while acting as a tutorial area for the players, has much more to it than simple narrow roads with guided objectives. While you have your main road to follow, there are side routes that will lead you to your first campfire where you can learn about the resting mechanic. Pushing further on, you'll learn that there's a bit of verticality in the world that requires some light platforming. Continuing onward would get you into three different scenarios. The first is that not everything would be accessible right off the bat, and you either need to learn how to reach some places or invent your own methods of progression. The second is the possibility of getting attacked by boss-like monsters in the world at any moment. And the third one is that there are dungeons so well hidden in the world that you might miss them entirely, unless you have an informed pawn in your party which we will talk about them later on in the video. But what I meant earlier about the world seem limited only at the surface level was to point out that the dungeons, or let's call them caves for the sake of consistency, can sometimes connect different points of the map together. While the level design is not as intricately done as Souls-like titles, these caves can still provide useful shortcuts and save you from future hassle. It's worth noting that the caves take different forms of layout as you progress through the game, with the early game caves being more twisted with lots of tunnels, to the late game caves being rather shorter, with instead hordes of mobs and harder enemies. Exploration and adventures are an important part of Dragon's Dogma 2's identity. Since quests feature minimal hand-holding, exploring every bit of the environment becomes crucial. During your discovery of the world, two things are always constant. The first is the ever-looming presence of the Munglint Tower as a reminder of the Arisen's main goal, and the second thing is the fact that you will always come across a new thing around basically every corner. And in order to pique your interest at a constant rate throughout your journey, Capcom designed the map with a certain rule in mind, and that is, wherever you go, you should be able to see multiple new points of interest. Since human is a curious being in its nature, your curiosity will drag you toward these newly spotted points of interest constantly. Also, finding these little discs known as Seeker Tokens would not only allow you to purchase special kinds of items, but also encourages you to go to the places you normally wouldn't venture into. This point-to-point -point design makes each trip into the world of Dragon's Dogma 2 highly organic as you're always prone to find something new or learn about the land's past, present and future. Beyond the points of interest, you can usually find multiple paths to your destination. For example, going from Vermont to Batal through the Checkpoint Town's border gate requires you to have some sort of permit. There are multiple ways of earning a permit, but that's not necessarily the only way forward, as you can find a very well hidden cave deep within the woods far from the Checkpoint Town, where a dragon is resting near its entrance. After putting some deadly cliffs and extremely annoying harpies behind, you'll end up straight into the capital city of Batal. Alternatively, by finding a hidden cave entrance near the checkpoint town, you'll be able to cross through some harsh mountain environment and finally reach Batal. But how did the developers manage to create such a masterfully designed world? To answer that question, we should take a look at what the game's director Hideaki Itsuno said in one of his interviews about the time he and his team went mountain climbing. Itsuno said 
that the closest way to the summit was a straight line, but nobody takes those routes. Everyone takes paths that circle around the mountain and the reason for that is not that you want to go but can't, it's that you don't even consider taking that route to begin with. The minimal hand-holding nature of the game also applies to the quests and their outcomes as well. So this is what it looks like. Brilliant. Many thanks, sir. Instead of choosing dialogue options like most other games, you shape things by taking action. Whether if this action is a delay in completing time-limited quests or it's giving the wrong item to the wrong NPC, you change the world by your specific choices entirely. While Dragon's Dogma 2 is solely a single-player game, the developers managed to make Pawn Companions a key part of Arisen's adventures and feel like an actual friend to players. Of course, there are definitely some areas like their delays in taking action or getting far behind the player that could benefit a lot from improvements. Sometimes hearing them repeating the same thing over and over again can become a bit irritating too. Oh, what luck! Tis a chest! But their usefulness makes up for these minor issues. Earlier in the video I mentioned that pawns could have a special information, provided that they have traveled beyond the rift to learn the secrets of the world from other players and maybe a new combat strategy, pawns can guide you to undiscovered locations, find and loot materials, carry your items, talk about different matters and most importantly, help you on your fights. It was Itsuno's dream to create an RPG that wasn't a chore to play and he wanted to make an RPG you could play alone that has still felt like an online experience. And he wasn't wrong about that as pawns will make up for the majority of your travels through the game and they will provide you with useful info all the time. They'll eventually start growing on you and you'll start forming a bond for every pawn that you hire. And choosing the right party combination can lead to better combat scenarios and less headache for players. But do be careful about hiring different pawns as they can inflict Dragon's Plague and can cause serious trouble for your journey. You can usually tell if a pawn is sick or not by taking a look at their eyes. Pawns can take damage and die and this could end up creating problems for you. Especially if you're stuck in the middle of the woods during the nighttime with a low amount of health and lots of enemies on your tail. That is unless you look at this game as your personal adventure and start camping every now and then. Camping would allow Arisen and the pawns to refill their health back to their full state. You can also start cooking some of the food you have gathered during your travels. Cooking is always followed by an actual live action scene which has a satisfying feeling to it and adds a special layer of immersion to your camping. Now you're not just limited to resting at outdoor camps and this is the part where we finally get to talk about the importance of cities. The cities in Dragon's Dogma 2 act as a world hub. While there are only two major cities in the game known as Wernworth and Bakbatal, you can also find villages or other small habitats as well, but cities in general have different forms of activities compared to the rest of the world. You can often find yourself spending a lot of your time and money in them. The best part about each city is how different they are compared to each other while still retaining some of the basics. This contrast comes down to the cultural differences between the two nations of Vermont and Batal. While Vermont resembles European environments, Batal is more reminiscent of southern hemisphere lands. The cultural differences in people and their behavior, their living style and beliefs, and the items they sell are just some of the small details you will immediately notice. When you go deeper, you'll understand that one city is against the idea of mixing Bistron with the human race due to political reasons, while the other is against the idea of allowing foreigners in its borders. In terms of architecture, Wormworth has generally tighter streets with four different quarters designated to each of its different citizen classes which splits into the slums, common quarter, merchant quarter and the noble quarter. The slums host sick, poor and orphans while in the common quarter, regular citizens reside. The merchant quarter hosts vendors and as you go up in the hierarchy, the noble quarter hosts people with expensive outfits who regularly visit the palace and luxurious establishments. Each of these locations has its own stories and micro-societies and you can easily tell the differences by taking a simple stroll into the city. Wernworth's architecture has a layer of verticality and by climbing on top of the rooftops you might discover a thing or two about the city while pleasing your inner parkour desires. On the other hand, Bakbatal is much simpler in its architectural design with its shorter buildings, wider streets, vibrant colors, huge marketplace and the famous dying factory. Her citizens are deeply loyal to their queen and they're much more protective of their kind against the pawns. Although you may find places that welcome pawns and don't follow the general opinion about these characters. During your time in each city, you might hear various rumors. 
For example, when in Wernworth, you might hear rumors about Vermont that it was originally a Bistran kingdom ruled by a king dubbed as the Mad Sovereign, and that all of the broken statues you find in the kingdom are the remaining signs of a long forgotten history. Things will take an interesting turn once you notice the intact statues of the Mad Sovereign by the time you arrive at Back Batal, so apparently the rumors might have been true all along. Everything I just described, layer by layer, adds a special personality to the game's world and ends up forming the amazing world-building blocks of the game. The environmental storytelling aspects are so strong that you'll start to learn more about them by living in these cities, an act that you can actually do if you decide to stay at inns or better yet, if you have the money to purchase your very own house. Owning a house means resting and saving free of charge. We'll get into the saving mechanic shortly, but buying a house also allows the NPCs you have helped along your journey to either visit you or send you letters and gifts from time to time. This alone makes the world feel much more alive compared to other open world games. The saving mechanic in Dragon's Dogma 2 is controversial to say the least. While there's an autosave system, you can always save your game manually as well. You can also save your game by resting at inns or at your house. But once you figure out that each playthrough only features one save slot and that the use of whatever saving system I just described overrides everything else, you'll start to get more cautious about your every single step. Inrests are pretty good for fixing your screw-ups or saving your skin from a glitchy situation, but they require constant going back and forth between places and might not be the most convenient option for everyone. Therefore, while it's definitely annoying, I believe this mechanic adds more weight to the adventures and decision makings and prevents players from save coming to some degree. As a result, you have to live with the consequences of the choices you have made and therefore you can't experience everything the game has to offer in one playthrough. I sent you out to change my mind. Inrests are hardly the game's only controversial mechanic as there are fast traveling methods that got the player base questioning the developer's intent. On one hand, we have the port crystals, an item which allows you to teleport from one point of the map to the other in an instance. There are only two permanent versions of them placed in almost convenient locations and the rest are obtained through your explorations of the world. On top of that, to use them you need fairy stones which are widely available and can be obtained from various vendors as well. On the other hand, we have ox cards. Using them is relatively cheaper but they only cover an extremely limited route with only a few stations between Melv and Back Batal. Unlike port crystals which you can place them anywhere you want and travel to them instantly, ox carts are in constant danger of getting ambushed by enemies and sometimes you need to clear the way before being able to use them. Ox carts can also be used to utilize the interconnected nature of some regions as well. Wanna go deep into the elven land to reach the sacred arbor? Unlock the ancestral cave shortcut and eventually you can use an ox cart from Vernworth to Melv and get to the sacred arbor in no time. As for the other means of travel, while it's possible to climb on top of a griffin or a harpy to get to other places, there are no horses or other rides of that nature in this game. Itsuna wanted to create a fun adventure game where you don't need horses to get around, but I think for a game that respects player choices in almost every regard, horses should have existed since the first place. Because the more you play the game and the more you discover, your desire to use the fastest means of travel to finish the remainder of your adventures increases. Like most open world games, the locations are not simply designed to be a one and done area. Traveling back to already visited locations might actually reward you with either a special item or even a new quest. This comes down to the fact that the game drip feeds the content to players to make the world feel alive and dynamic. Therefore, there's always an active incentive to go back to an already discovered location. Time of day plays a critical role in explorations as well. During the day, you can see towering high smoke in the distance, signaling a possible campsite. As time goes on and the day grows darker, it gets harder to detect smoke. So if you're in need of a campfire, you can look out for fire cinders in the distance. But nighttime is rather different compared to daylight. During the night, even if you have a lantern on your side, your visibility is extremely limited. Nights usually have an eerie mood to them, and the nighttime enemies are especially spookier and more powerful. This easily adds up to the enemy variety of the game and helps it from getting too repetitive. As you progress further into both countries, the enemy's looks and behaviors starts to change. This could be due to the fact that the enemies in Vermont are living in abundant lands, while the ones in Batal had to adapt to living in a harsh environment. Other than normal mobs, we have boss fights such as Medusa, Golems, Drakes, Chimeras, Ogres and many more. 
In fact, I think they are pretty varied. But since the enemy encounter frequency might get higher in some areas, it might feel like there's not much variety among the enemies. There's a reason for high enemy frequency, and that comes down to the fact that you can always choose a new vocation, and you need to upgrade the areas and, and the main pawn's skills regularly. Boss fights are truly epic. Just like normal enemies, they can also utilize their surroundings in combat as well, and based on the time of day, they can become more difficult. However, there's a slight balancing issue regarding the combat system in general, as you can get pretty overpowered by the second half of the game and obliterate the once scary enemies in just seconds. This brings us to the point that either the encounter frequency should be reduced or the game desperately needs a hard mode. I just hope that the supposed hard mode is more than spongier enemies as I expect it to feature hardcore mechanics and possibly new enemy types. Vocations are the roles that you can choose for yourself and your main pawn. There are plenty of them and getting mastered at each takes a lot of time and practice. Each vocation grants you and the pawn different abilities and by leveling them up, new skills become available. While vocations are used for different combat strategies, instead of looking at their effectiveness in combat, we are going to talk about their impact on the exploration. Some vocations can interact differently with the environment compared to others. For example, sorcerers can levitate in the air for a short amount of time. Doing so would allow them to reach places previously unreachable. But what if you're a fighter or a warrior? These vocations have the ability to launch pawns into the air. Imagine launching them someplace higher and asking them to bring you collectibles or maybe drop the ladder down. It is possible to unlock a shortcut in this way as well. All of that comes down to the fact that there are multiple ways the game allows you to find a solution to an already existing problem and create your unique style of adventure. Dragon's Dogma 2 features a dynamic world with unique side quests where you can create your very own solutions for the already existing challenge. The game has a collectible system that encourages exploration and thanks to its extremely well-crafted world, you're always seeing an interesting thing around every corner. And let's not forget about its masterful world building and the amazing environmental storytelling as well. Keeping the idea of an epic adventure while entertaining players for a long period of time is no small task. While the bar was already set high by games such as The Legend of Zelda and Elden Ring, if we take the detail and the scope of this game into account, somehow the brilliant team at Capcom has managed to create one of the most special games ever. Dragon's Dogma 2 succeeds where most other open worlds fail. It isn't loosely based on an idea and knows what it wants to deliver. This game proves that the true meaning of open world games is not about having a ginormous map with a checklist of items to do. It's about how immersive a game world can be using the combination of thoughtful design and useful mechanics. While the saving and fast traveling systems are a bit controversial, their existence made the exploration aspect of the game flourish even more, and whether it was intended or not, they increased the immersion of the game even further, and for all of that, Dragon's Dogma 2's world is a masterclass in exploration. This was a long journey, Arisen. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to hit the subscribe button for more content. Also, I'm genuinely curious about what you think about the game and the video in general, so share your opinions in the comment section. And more than that, if you leave a like to the video, it would personally make me happy. Thanks for watching the video. See you in the next one. I suppose you must have some attachment to this place arisen, given how often we've made use of it.